Um, Matthew Dunster, the director, was hoping to join us, but he's tied up at work with another project. He also has triplets. So I think if I give you those two reasons, I think you can hopefully fill in the gaps as to why he's unable to attend this evening. Uh, he sends his apologies. I was going to try and do a, a, an impression of Matthew Dunstan for the rest of the You'll only get back to him and I'll be in trouble when I see him. Um, so, uh, thanks for coming. I mean, what, what we thought we would do is you know, we'll, we'll talk for a bit of time. Uh, I'm, I and I are working together on the project. We'll just have some questions in the chat. But as you've probably worked out, we are not the performers of this production. So, um, if anybody wants to interrupt us at any time with anything at all, please do. Just stick your hand up and be informal in that way or just block something out. Um, I think that's best for most of you. We prefer, we prefer it if there's a bit of chat going both ways. So just feel, to ask, uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, so I'm going to start off, Anna, and I wanted to ask you, so you were approached by Matthew to design this show um, and you read the script. What was your first Got some either play or where you wanted to go in terms of design? Um, well, it was a, a you know earlier version, the first one that I read, so it comes slightly slightly different to what it is now, not not too much. Um, and uh, you know, it's, you, you read it, it's a it's, it's a very powerful piece, and it gets to you in a, uh, in, a in a way that maybe a lot of other um, stories don't. And um, it's also one of those situations where you think, oh yeah, I know a little bit about, you know, um, that civil war, and you start looking into it, and, and I realised I didn't actually know that much, and and how much more one should know, and uh, how um, moving these stories are, and um, and I think it felt quite quickly to me that it was um, it was a story that um, needed a, a, you know a, a different relationship to the audience. Um, I really quite strongly felt, met you felt like that too in our first conversations, it felt very strongly that it's not something where you, you sit back and you know something starts and you look at it and then you know opens and you you have that perspective as a as a <clears throat> you know viewer and you know you follow the story but it doesn't touch you the same way as, as when you're right in the middle of it. So you're um, I really felt that you know these the stories of these uh, young people and how they are kind of they are grabbed and thrown into that situation and they have no way to escape it and and you know it is so brutal and in your face that um, uh, just felt quite strongly that's that's something that I wanted the audience to kind of have an experience okay. of that and and you know I know it's quite tough being pushed around but it is that kind of thing of not of not being able to <coughs> to run we've got to stay and face it. So when so those first conversations with Matthew in the way that it happens, you, know, you, you both will have a response to the yeah. to the text and the ideas. Was was it the relationship of how the audience would view the piece? Was that the kind of the driving thing as that opposed was, to any other particular design? That was definitely one of our first, uh, you know. Um, feelings that we had towards how we wanted to stage it was definitely about, you know, what to do with this space and what to do with the audience. So, so rather than kind of starting with images and pictures and, you know, we need, I don't know how to, we need this, it was very much about that. So quite different to how you approach it otherwise. So, so what's that process then? Because I think that would be interesting for people is, so you've, you've had this, and you've read the play, you and Matthew have had some initial conversations and you've starting to share ideas. What's the next bit of process that you as a designer go through to try and come up with an aesthetic or an idea or something to share? Um, well, you know, after, after usually, um, and Matthew and I have worked together a lot, so there's kind of a, you know, sure, primary yeah. priority, and it, which is quite nice cause, as, as well, because there's kind of, you know, we relax with each other, you kind of, there's a trust, so that's, that's very helpful. So usually we have, you know, first conversations which are very, very loose. So we're kind of not trying to tie each other down. It's just about what interests us. What is, you know, what is the centre of the story that, the bit of the story that we want to tell. 
and then, and then usually I go off and start thinking about it spatially. You know, what, how how can we, how can I approach it, and how can I approach the the space? And that's when I kind of start. Then I start looking at a lot of images. And in this case, just of Liberia, and you know um, how. Uh, how you know the different menus are structured? What's what is it like in a in a small village, and what's the material that buildings are built out of, and and uh, you know what's life there, and then kind of going to a bigger city, for example, you know what in contrast what it's like then, and very quickly I felt, for example, with with um, this one is that it felt like um, there's lots of things that have been started and not finished. There's lots of construction. There's you know there's an element of of any material you can find, anything is utilized. Everything is utilized, and things are, you know, have one function, but they're also used for something else. Or the, you know, something that has been is broken, you use it and make, you know, combine it with something else and make something new. And 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 uh, and the fact that you know, and especially in the city, there there are a lot of people. So there's someone everywhere looking from you know different uh, positions, and yeah, and that as well that would be something that I quite like to bring in here is that. Uh, uh, you know, there are different platforms, different levels for people are that, that the audience also, so, you know, on one hand you experience it because you're in the space, but also the audience becomes part of that environment, so, you know, otherwise I couldn't fill a platform just with 20 actors and say, you know, you've got a bunch of people living up there, but in this oh, case you yes. can make the audience part of the, yeah. And of course the trick is to try and separate the two main areas, which is, you know, the yes. rural landscape yeah. of like here, I mean, of course. Absolutely, and that was one of the biggest tasks in a way, and, and obviously, especially if you do it like that, where everything is one route, you know, so how do you travel from one to the other? And um, and another thing that we both felt really strongly about, and Diana as well actually, is is, is the, you know, the sense that we really wanted uh, to create something that hopefully when you enter into the space, you really do feel like, you're, you're going somewhere else. You're entering into a, a you know a, a, a country and an atmosphere that isn't the same as outside. And um, but also that uh, which I think one thing that I think is brilliant in the story is that it starts somewhere that is so different. You think you think you're going to see you know or, or listen to a story that is about you know this lovely relationship between a grandmother and a granddaughter you know in a beautiful um, uh, rural setting and. Um, and then that just gets, you know, smashed to pieces in, in no time. They're thrown into something completely yeah, different. Apart, yes, yeah. yeah. And that's something that, you know, so I really wanted the audience to feel when you come in that, you know, it is you're in a, you're in a very kind of uh, warm space, you know, in a, in a homely, in a, you know, family environment, and and that the process of of taking um, you from from that into the other story was a physical destruction. So, you know, the, the idea of the huts and that that gets taken apart, so, you know, you're kind of literally taking apart that world, ripping it into pieces and taking it somewhere else. One of the things we talked about before we came through this evening was this notion of, so tell me if this is a bad idea, was just this sense of understanding where the design ideas came from from the show and how we ended up getting to where we are this evening, if that's. So, uh, so you, Matthew, you've been having some great time. You've been looking at thousands of images, and been spending evenings looking through days, looking through Google, finding all kinds of fun stuff. So the next bit, of course, as we know, the truth within these is that the director and designer invariably have this amazing time of creativity where all kinds of possibilities seem. And then there's a boring bit when the production manager himself turns up in your studio and sees for the first time what you've been working on. Uh, tells you what you can't uh, have. <laughs> throws in some reality in there. Um, trying to, I'm, I'm always in general trying to remember that what happened at that first. I mean, you, you, by that point, you'd, you'd made a scale model of yes. the theatre yeah. and various elements within it. Yeah. And then, I mean, it was fairly smooth. Was it process? Okay. Was it? Yeah. So not, not kind of too. Uh, and having to cut a lot of things, but but you know, lots of conversations about how you know it's always like that, isn't it? How can we achieve all of the things that we want? 
and um, and then there are compromises to be uh, made and, yeah. and and then also I guess the you know how do you approach it? It's very different, isn't it? In different designs, you approach differently, and who you um, work with, so who builds what. So we have suggested a, a builder for um, the different items, like the car. You know that's uh, and and he was he was great because he was very. It's very creative, isn't he? And he got he got the idea immediately of what it was. You know, I said I wanted. Um, so the, the idea of the hut is based on the construction of the mud hut. So it's it's basically the inner structure before you would then add the mud to the building. And quite often, because people already start living in it before it's finished, so you do actually see people being inside. You know, that kind of grid. And obviously, I needed to build something that was a hut that you could see into it from all different angles. And he was very excited about that, yeah. and he kind of said, I'm going to get my, because I said, I want the wood to have natural shapes, so not something that comes out of the factory and is cut, and you kind of try and shape it. So he actually went to the woods with an ant axe. Yeah, he was very, he was very keen about yeah. trying not to make sure that anything was going yeah. to come out of a timber yard, yeah. which was really very lucky. Thing. And the other interesting thing, or, you know, for me with this was that, um, uh, so you have your scale model, and, and, and most of the time, you know, it goes off to a set builder and the whole thing gets built and then you have your, your kind of get in time and it gets set up and that's it. Whilst with this one, because because of the element of, of kind of, uh, you know, the, the original bits that you find, it wants to keep that randomness and that kind of a natural feel to to these items actually being real. So yeah. our decision was to look into, you know, junkyards and, and just... An old farm yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> and um, just found collected lots of things and so you know the, the it was a little bit more um, I don't know unsure uh, by the time we got in here what it was going to be like because the main structure was there but then it was we were actually in the room for a day kind of just I just picked pieces and said that bit let's put yeah. it in that bit let's go there and um, so half of the creation was in this room wasn't it? There was but you did give very Serious to you, and I haven't said this before, but you, you did give very good, clear instruction in terms of the parameters around how we, as the people who are delivering the site, can you know where we where we can go with things. So um, you wanted, wherever possible, for things to be real. So you know that rusted corrugated iron is just rusted corrugated it's iron. Fine. There's not much. <laughs> we found twenty sheets of it lying in a farmer's field, and we bought it for pennies. So that's recycling and, and, and salvage at its best. There's bits of previous shows lying around in here. I won't point to anything out. We've got some things built, and so some things had to look naturalistic. Um, but you also, you know, allowed for a, a, a rough, it, unfinished aesthetic, which is an absolute godsend when you're up against it, trying to build a set to have some things not looking quite finished off. But then there's the, the decision to get things printed, which yes. is kind of goes contrary to the notion of realism and what was the was that just experience or was there any other reason why you, you like the, the the obvious printedness of, of these kind of images? Yeah, I guess um, there's always I mean I, I guess the the bush was one of the main things where, you know, if you I mean as you know, if you're if you're doing a uh, a greenery and something natural on stage is the most difficult thing to achieve and for it to, to look right. And I really didn't want anything fake in here. And obviously the closer the audience is, the less you get away with it not being right. So I think it was that and also finding, uh, just finding images of, you know, like the picture behind you, just su such powerful images of, um, uh, you know, the, the actual scenario that if I felt like I'd love to have a combination where some of it is, is this, you know, you stand on it, it's real, you feel it under your feet. And then the other bits that um, would feel fake in here because it's not, it's, you know, you can never get it quite real in here. Uh, to be very honest about the fact that, that's, that that is a cutout that we've taken from the actual setting. And I'm, I'm not saying it's anything else, but that that is what it is. You know, it's, a, it's kind of a... You know, in a way, you know, an artistic way of showing that mm. side combined with something that's very casual, something that you can touch and feel. And that, yeah, that's where, where the idea of the kids came from. And as well as being asked to create an environment for the audience and for us to 
place. And we also have to look after all costume design as well. Mm -hmm. We have a great costume supervisor. But again, how, how was that process pretty much the same yourself and Matthew, or did you involve the company? How was how was that process of the same? Um, but but you know, it was it was. Uh in this case, the process where I didn't do a drawing, it was very much about, um, uh, you know, we found such amazing pictures of, uh, of these child soldiers and what, you know, just what they pick up, what they wear, what they find, anything that, you know, they can get their hands on that I felt, um, uh, you know, that there was no more um, that needed to be done design-wise, as in, you know, you, um, I didn't want it to be too rigid either, and so I said to the supervisor, who's the person who, who actually kind of, you know, creates and organizes the costume to just go and find things that, that kind of feel like they are from that world and then we do the same thing basically so we, we did that um, and I you know I had rough kind of ideas he's gonna roughly be like that he's more that character she's more that character which I talked to with Matthew but then we actually just did it in <coughs> so you get the actor in and we, we had a big rail of stuff and just and so does, things does the actor, out. Did the actor have a bit of... Um, well, yes, we did have conversations, absolutely we had conversations before, and then, you know, within that, they, you know, it's, again, it's also, I think, a show where they need to, they need to absolutely feel comfortable, they need, they need to feel like they've found, they've found that character. And, um, and so it, it, that's what we did, and then, you know, when I was happy and they said, yes, I love it, this feels really right, then, you know, that was it, that was the costume. So quite an exciting, very enjoyable process, actually. Right. <laughs> yeah. <That's good>. yeah. <coughs> and um, I mean, obviously, there's we, we have this term within the theatre, which I'm, I'm still not convinced I totally enjoy, which is this notion of the creative team, which basically embodies the director, the writer, the various designers. It seems to exclude all the people who are probably the right ways, maybe. But um, <laughs> uh, working with but lighting designers and sound designers, do, is, that, uh, is that something you normally have get involved in or do you separate various disciplines? No, absolutely, we do it together, we'll get, yeah, we get involved. And, um, and quite, you know, there's, there's uh, always a mix, I think, I mean, I, I always have very strong uh, ideas and feelings towards light, definitely, because I think a lot of what I do um, some of it only works if the lighting is right, um, and and also it's enjoyable to create something around the whole lighting design. I love this, you know, you know, really want to work with that, want to work with that. But then obviously the other amazing thing is that you have someone who is brilliant at what they do, know so much more than I would ever know, and and so it's about kind of hopefully getting the other people excited about it and talking through what the general kind of idea and feeling of it is, and then and then they add their bits and. You know, as we go through the tank, sometimes there is something where I go, well, you know, um, I'd rather have it a bit like that, yeah. or what do you think about, you know, having a slightly different turn to it. So, yeah, no, we work very closely. But you did do quite a lot of storyboarding effectively with, on this show, I yeah. noticed with yourself and the, the other design team kind of going through each scene and saying, you know, let's have a light bulb at this point, but yeah. how can we do that? How dark can we keep it for the audience to come in? What's safe? What what allows us how bright is bright. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and and the same with sound actually was one of the very early ideas or uh, things that Matthew and I talked about were the radios because they they seem to be quite important as people really listen to the radio and get lots of information on the radio and, and there were a lot there was quite a bit of sound written into the script that felt like if you now just make it come from theatre speakers and, and that's what it is then you, uh, there's kind of, again, a bit of a fakeness to it. So we, we felt that if the radios become part of the environment, then if you hear the children singing to the radio, that's fine, and that's part of that world. And if the announcements come through, then you know you don't always have to carry on the radio to announce someone's making an announcement. But um, that again, that becomes part of it. So the sound designer and I spoke about it quite early, and how much he you know, where he wanted. So so the placing of the radios, for example, is probably collaboration. He says, well, he needs to definitely have some speakers and then... Yeah, they seem kind of to be called a bit. more and more radios <coughs> kept going in. Yes. About, you know, up after tech, day. and then we were previewing, and then we were getting to opening night, and there was more radios being stuck up, yeah. <laughs> along with all these posters. I'm not quite sure I wouldn't get one of those off. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 Um, uh, but I couldn't find I couldn't find a good enough version of it to actually use in the pen, so I redrew it. But but the actual thing in with the red and black is something that they sprayed everywhere. And the propaganda picture, I don't think in that combination. I think that um, uh, it was kind of necessarily as a poster out at the time. But obviously, a combination of the flag and Taylor in front of it is something that they actually. I tried to find propaganda pictures and posters of him and I couldn't find anything so pre internet though well, you know it's it like is. And, so. and obviously the other problem that we had is that all the images we find they really are snapshots. They you know the quality is so poor. And so luckily with, with these images the you know the printer meant pushed them quite a bit because um, yeah, they're tiny files, and so I, and you know, others I, I did find, but they're somewhere in the background, you know, of, a, of an image. And by the time you enlarge it, it's so blurred that you can't really use it. So, so we had to, yeah, we basically, I, I found um, some references, and then some of it we had to recreate a little bit to be usable. I have to say, it was kind of my, one of my favourite things. And this was always lots of little bits of paper just getting stuck, or yes. a tea break would happen, and. And it would be out with our spray bottle, just sticking more things on and just and if you keep looking there's hundreds of them around and some of them are so small. Yeah, that would be yeah. You were gonna ask a question. I, I was. Um, it's a very active show and there's a lot of fight scenes, particularly for something where you've got an audience which is milling around. Are you having very different experiences with different audiences? Because it felt today that everybody was like round the edges. But are there some performances where everybody is like it's much very, more yeah. involved and closer to the action. It, they're very different, I think. I mean, I haven't, <coughs> I haven't been here in the last couple of weeks, I guess, but I saw quite really a few well. previews, and you hear from the actors later today, they were like this, and today they were like that. And you've got audiences who, who um, are very kind of timid and stay to the back, and then sometimes it feels like after about 10 minutes, People kind of forget it, and then and then sometimes you have really brave, you know, groups of people who just quite consciously shift. But we had we had days where this was completely full. So every time there was a scene, as you know, there's quite a bit happening there. They had to literally shift a whole lot of people, and then sometimes bizarrely it all stayed completely clear. So yeah, it's it's very different, and I think that was one of the most challenging things for this show. It's not just that it's always tricky for actors to have to, um, whilst they're doing their parts, you know, also see all that and, and be able to move it. It's a very young cast, so for most of them it's the first time they've ever done anything like this. It is a brave choice in terms of designing and staging because you, you, you want to ensure that everyone has a good experience. So you want the audience to have a good experience, you want the cast to have a good experience, you kind of want to just get through the run as safely as well as you can but we have kind of got some quite random objects around here we've tried as much as possible to make this place a safe environment for them. Mm. that's one of the brilliant things in the show it's the fact that it's a brutal and brilliant show and you can't really imagine it once you've done your work on it it had been done another way i think that's a really good thing to notice because it could have been done many ways mm. it could be done really badly actually you could imagine it done really badly, and I think it's been done very well. I had a, a bigger question about the Royal Court's commitment to this kind of work, because it's easy enough to see immersive work all around London the last 20 years, but there hasn't been at the Royal Court particularly. I came to see Bowlers off the ends some years ago, a great show in the main stage, where we were sent a text on the day because one of the performers, so solid group former, jumped off the stage down into the auditorium. We were sent a text telling us our group would have to move because they didn't want us to be effectively sort of at risk when this person jumped out. Well, that's only four or five years ago. And the care that was being taken in the auditorium to make sure that free song, that risk didn't kind of take place, was indicative of a very well behaved theatre. Yeah. Now, tonight, we're in a place <laughs> where people are kicking shit around, then <laughs> rightly putting it in our face. Was what else is the story about it? It's about something in people's faces. So, to my mind, it begins to really address the problem of the kind of very well mannered royal court. So, it's interesting to see how far this now gets pushed, because there's a huge appetite for it. 
Yeah. It's the court that's been catching up. It's been yeah. going on all over London for years, but what we found tonight, for me in this particular production, was an aesthetic or a way of working that was really responsive to the writer's mm. brilliance. I thought it was a, an extraordinary show. Mm. Yeah, very much. I mean, I suppose I, I mean, I'd answer that as somebody who watched the wrong court for is that you know, what, whatever we do, we, tr we try and deliver the best production that that writer and then the combination of everybody else who's a supporting that writer. Whatever we can give them, and if, you know, as you say, there's so many different ways that you can, I mean, and all of this work has never been performed before. So when we start out, we have no, no idea, we could do whatever, and you, you don't know which way you're going to be led. And you know, I like the, the fact that at the weekend, um, on Friday and Saturday, we had, as you say, this kind of chaos of here, organised very well done with chaos. But downstairs, we had a very clean and crisp production of 2071, which is a very different side of Stephanie, and I think, uh, without going on too much about the quarter or, or anything, I think the fact that we are confident to deliver different designs of different styles to different audiences for different places, I think that's only right. I, I, I don't think it's for the court to decide a, a design style for any of this project. I think that's all to our designers yeah. and our designers. And I think, I mean, because I'm, I'm freelance, so, you know, I go wherever the work takes me. So, uh, but, but uh, you, you know, the experience is different at different theatres. And, and one thing that I absolutely have to say for the court is that you're completely supported. So we came with this idea, but I'm sure, you know, in other places, everyone would have gone, oh my God. You know, who knows? No way we can do this, and that's difficult. And there was, there was, you know, it was great because there was no resilience. It was just a yes, we get it, and that's what we, that's what we're gonna do. Just didn't tell me to face. No, exactly. <laughs> 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 was there any thought given to, to using smell? Because I'm, for example, at the Donmar, they used incense for Richard the Second, and before Red, they had somebody going around, effectively splashing around oil paints, so that. There was a visceral smell that's when you first walked into the space. Yeah. We've, we've experienced that a few times. I don't think we've talked a bit smell much of this. It's quite tricky to actually smell. It tends to be a bit bad. We wanted, mm. I think we, we pushed it with, you know, firing guns in people's faces. <laughs> so they <laughs> really murdering the fire. <laughs> then I thought, oh, no, this may leave smell. Let's not do that smell. It was something. I would say you effectively, effectively used smell. You had the cigarettes, mm -hmm. um, as well as the soup mm -hmm. that was yeah. being given. Yeah. And I remember smelling it and thinking, oh wow, that, that's real. Yeah. Yeah. That's yes. actually being eaten, and these cigarettes are actually being sold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's easy in this space, obviously, because you were in a fairly small room. <laughs> so, you know, yes, these things you can actually smell, which otherwise you might not be able to, because you're not near enough. So that's nice, it's nice that you kind of, yeah. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about the rehearsal process and tech and kind of introducing the actors to both this, this scenario of the set and kind of breaking it down when they weren't physically in this space and with all of the set. So how did you kind of adapt with them going from rehearsal into uh, this room? Well, I mean, you know, I, I kind of have to speak for Matthew a little bit because I'm not always in rehearsal, so, I, you know, I just get little snippets. But um, I think, uh, you know, what you usually do is that so we have, we have the model of this space, and so on the first rehearsal day, um, you know, uh, there's a gathering around that, and then, you know, Matthew and I um, introduced the idea, and that was the first time that they heard about you know, how we were going to do it. And so we kind of tend to try and spend quite a bit of time on that, so it's a really, you know, everybody who's involved understands that that's the general idea, this is how you want to do it. <laughs> and um, and then there's a mark out in the rehearsal room of kind of what is where, and, and we said quite in, from the beginning there are certain items that are quite important to have. So the card, the card uh, we had, you know, two, on, two weeks yeah. into rehearsals because, mm -hmm. you know, and in my experience also, I know that if if I if I want to have an item uh, in a show that is used a lot and um, becomes quite kind of integral to the show and and. You know, I have my ideas of what I think it should do, but I'm also hoping a director will elaborate on that and have more ideas. It's got to be there. If it's not there, the director won't use it because he'll use whatever he's 
gloves and hands, and you know, we can stick to some things, but it's quite tricky, you know. And so, yeah, so it was great that some bits we were, they already had, so they could really, could really play with it. So um, I did want it to be turned over, but I think, you know, the way they then do it and they feel conf confident with it is because they actually had done it quite a lot. And, um, but I think the trickiest thing for this one was, um, uh, well, some things they didn't have in the rehearsal room, so they didn't have the right platform and the right heights, but it's mainly the floor, so they didn't have the sand. And so all the fights uh, were created without this floor. And, um, you know, we did a little test to show them when the fight director had a bit of a kind of test with it, but, you know, and so they had to spend a little bit more time, I guess, than usual to really kind of make sure that it worked on this floor. Yeah. That's actually going to be my question. Is this is a very it's a very big choice to use a covering for the floor like this. First of all, expensive. Second of all, just practical reasons. I just want to know a little bit of your reasoning why you felt you really need to have the sand. Um, the it's uh, you know it's something that probably started coming out of images. Is it's you know it seems like um, uh, you know we, here everything is covered in concrete, isn't it? And and that's something that I really felt looking at images of. Of Liberia is that so much there's so much earth still everywhere and and the color is so um, you know um, specific and quite amazing and something that you know uh, I also felt that gives the warm glow that makes you feel like it's a it's hot you know it's a hot country and um, and that everything has to be built on that you know and it probably is everywhere I guess and then but then also um, the sense that uh, you know the audience then therefore is on the same ground as the actors. So you feel under your feet what they're feeling under their feet. And I think as soon as you step onto this, you, it's just different. You feel like you're in a specific kind of world and space. And, and that's what I really liked about it. It's, um, you know what it is? It's, it's rubber crumb. Yeah. It's very playable with you. Know, you really want to... Shredding cartons. Sometimes, yeah, it's shredding cartons have been dyed. There's a few different colours in there. We, there was an initial <laughs> desire that it should be red earth. And we looked into red earth and red stones and so on. And, I mean, I, quite a few theatre shows over the years have used earth, and um, I've done quite a few of them. And I, I, was, I, I have to say, that was one of those moments where the design team and myself were not really agreeing because I had concerns with earth that some of this gets too dry, it's gets sort of dust, it's not. So the audience start coughing, but then of course the caster and then did the nature was weak in the stuff, and then it's and it's all through the building. And, <laughs> so on and, on and, on and, and it's just you know where does it come from? And somebody just goes and digs some earth up. You know what are you digging up? And so, sort of so we we found this, and the colour was good, and it it feels kind of soft underfoot. I, I I do have a confession that was probably not I accept. It was probably not enough, but then that's. Budget. That's yeah. there's, 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 a, there's a choice. It's a big square meterage. Of, and it keeps so, shifting so. to the side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's up here. I know, but the fight director loved it. She says she said, "I want a floor like this always," because it's actually also what you have in playground. So it's it's very soft. You know, if you fall, you fall soft. And actually, because it is rubber, which is better than earth, earth slides on the floor underneath mm -hmm. quite. So usually you put the carpet and then. Uh, from top, yes. this, as soon as you've got some mason, it actually really keeps yes. your... Mm -hmm. But we keep yeah. finding it, and you, you go home and... <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, quite to the contrary, uh, I'm from Liberia, I help Diana with play. Uh, I got the voice of Charles Taylor, you know, mm -hmm. right? And uh, when we go to the earth, someone from Africa would think that this is the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm which is quite obvious in that real tropical country. I mean, uh, so, I mean, it's beautiful though. Yeah. I mean, the scenery is good. Um, the play is well done. I mean, we really liked it. Um, what I saw was that the actors started off with the Liberian accent, and then they drifted into something more Sierra Leonean, Ghanaian, some more like British, like West Africa, and so if somebody from Liberia listened to the play, they would rather, or someone from West Africa, they were, they might call the play Sierra Leone Girl. <laughs> but actually, <laughs> in reality, I mean, we live through the reality of what was and 
put all together. We just need for it all. So well done, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, how were the actors, um, how did they get into their parts originally? What kind of research did they need to do for their individual characters? Um, again, I mean, Matthew would have no more about this. If only Matthew was here, he would tell you all these things. Uh, you know, I'm, and I'm not quite sure how much research they did themselves. Um, there's an amazing film called um, Johnny Mad Dog, I don't know if you saw it, which uh, is um, about um, child soldiers in the and I think some of the actors were actual child soldiers, so they, we definitely watched that a couple of times. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I'm sure they each do their own thing as well. And um, I think it's also that process of how rehearsals are, I mean, there's so, uh, I don't know who, who's all, all involved in theatre and they're doing, there's so many different ways to rehearse a play, and there's so many different ways to provide all the stimuli for the team. Uh, what, I, what I observed from Matthew's process was, you know, there would be, uh, you know, some people you, you start and you have your cup of tea or coffee in the morning and there's lots of chatting and you read the play and you do a bit more chatting and then eventually you get up and you move around. And, you kind of do that for four weeks and then you put the show on. Matthews was kind of a bit different, I seem to recall. It was like first day, it was like, right, let's go warm up. And it was like two hours of hard exercise. You really wanted to get everybody fit because, of course, that's kind of key to us. And there were some big sequences that we really wanted to nail. So that was, it was like military, his own type of the military warm up. And then there was a lot of discussion about the play and the various different themes within it. And you know, Matthew and all the team, they're the ones who are doing a lot of the research so that they're able to respond to some of the questions. And I think that often the performers find their own ways through that. And I think it's sometimes some of it is given by direct answer to this is what the situation is. And other times it's, a, it's their interpretation of their response to, to the text that's written. So I think it's, it was quite, it was fascinating to be here, we'd hear those songs coming out, my office is just above the rehearsal rooms, I just hear these songs out twice a day, and then I'd see them having done these, this circuit training, that one thing that I seem to recall was just called, the, it was and I don't quite know what that was, but yeah. it's really really quite tired of that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, what I noticed with, uh, with this show and the rehearsals and the cast is that obviously, you know, they're, they're kind of very tough scenes for anyone to do, but for someone quite young to do and be confronted with every time, it's quite hard. And um, so they, they found a really natural way of balancing that by having quite a lot of fun as soon as they're, so they would kind of, you know, stop rehearsals and then put music on and literally dance for five minutes, five or ten minutes. And I think that's, you know, if we, I, you know, I, I understand that they really needed to have a kind of a moment of just getting away from it, but it not to kind of get too much. I mean, I found that with the research, but I've never, I can honestly say, I've never um, done a show where I had to stop that much when I was researching. You know, you, you really, you know, you do 15 minutes and you just absolutely need to get away from it for a bit because it's so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. We'll take maybe for another couple of questions. Yeah. You um, besides um, experiencing like the immersive experience, what were you hoping the audience added to the production itself? Like, were you hoping on like one of the prop or like part of the set, or how would you? What was your intention? Like? Yeah, it's kind of it, you know, it's uh, it definitely a little bit part of the set as well. You know, uh, as I said, the nice thing. The nice uh, thing is that it felt like um, I had more, you know, more bodies available than you would have otherwise, and and because so many of these places, especially as soon as they get to the checkpoints and they get into the city, you know, there are, you know, there are so many people. And really, you only had um, nine in the cars. Yeah. That's not really enough to make it feel like you're in a crowded place. So um, uh, yeah, it was those two things. Firstly, for the audience to physically be near as you know, um, as you experience it, but then also to, to um, you know, have more volume and feel it and more people around, yeah. Anybody else get any other questions? Just got a question related to that. When I came into the room, I anxiously answered the question that I wanted to be 
involved. And uh, when I came into the room, I saw <coughs> looking around for a couple of safe spots and saw a couple. And then quite early on in the play, the, the actors go to those places, like particularly this seat here. Mm -hmm. They go straight to that and kick off the people that are sitting there. Go straight over to that corner where I thought I was safe. Was that, <laughs> was that part of, did you think about that? I mean, right at the start of the talk, you mentioned about um, in, involving the audience. And was there, were you trying to balance how involved they were, how safe they maybe thought yeah. they were felt, or just well, I think that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I guess um, Matthew's experience <coughs> comes in and, and also um, probably, you know, the kind of history of our collaboration whenever I work with Matthew, I feel that if there's a general idea of this is what we want to do and this is the principle, he's very, very, uh, um, he really honours that and he really sticks with it and is truthful to that. So I always knew if I give him a space like this, he, he's not just playing long snake in the middle and forgets about you know the outside. He would absolutely take it to heart. But then I think what I felt was this one, and I have to really say when I kind of saw it for the first time in this space, I thought, wow, you know, you really, really have thought all of this through. Because I think to make this thing work, you don't just want the moments where you know well, let's shift this because we need to get the car here and you stick a gun in someone's face. You want to you right from the beginning. You want people to realise that there's you know, there are going to be little bits where someone goes here and someone goes there and it doesn't matter if you stand there, the actor just walks through and, you know, gets what they need. So, so it's not a few kind of artificial moments where all of a sudden you interact, but it, right from the offset it just becomes a language. And then hopefully the audience, you know, with every kind of minute becomes more relaxed. And I don't know how you felt, but I always feel the first ten minutes and the first shift, everyone's a bit like, well, where should I go? And, and then after a while, you just, yeah, you move a bit to that side, and then you see there's a bit of an empty spot there, and then you move over there, and it kind of, you know, you, you lose your fear of, you know, having to, yeah, be part or kind of, you know, walk within a show. And I think some of that movement is very, very subtle. It's yes. really impressive, because it's, as you said, there's quite a lot that happens around the country, the world now, but it's the scene towards the end when basically you get shot twice. And when we first did the run through with the audience, which was only a few hours before the first run through with the paying audience, I, I, I nearly jumped in and stopped that because I thought there's no way that we're going to ever be able to get pull a gun out with that group of people in that close proximity to that. But something happened. And it was amazing because it had been pre-thought through and you just have to trust it. That an action, a couple of shots, a push, and you know the audience just backed away, backed away. And before you knew it, you had quite a big area and everything was safe and you know, we'd worked out how far people had to go and whatever happened. So all that's, that's all created. Was that a fluke? It happened the same the next time we did it, and again and again and again. So some of that is, you know, it's a game, and sometimes you're moved from somewhere not because you need that that's area now for this scene, but maybe in two scenes time, but we know if we move you to that point now, they'll then move over there and actually you'll now be in a better position. So it's, it was impressive to understand how much of that. Mm. And the other interesting thing I think with moving the audiences, uh, and, and I think uh, which Matthew did so brilliantly, is that there's different versions, isn't there? It's like if, if Mummy Esther goes and collects some things from over there, then she's not really addressing anyone. She finds a little path and it's kind of, you know, takes a thing and goes over, which is very different to someone going, get out of my way. And so I think he's found different ways of, of, of that kind of communication mm -hmm. with the audience. Um, unless anyone's got such a bonding question, I feel that we've taken up the time. Uh, let's see, thank you. Uh, for